My name is Thomas Hunter. Of course, this talk is uh, the long road to async and await in JavaScript. If you're here for the quick and easy path to async and await, uh, that one's next month. Uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about the, I guess I call it the evolution of asynchronous control flow as it exists in JavaScript. Uh, and so we sort of have these four phases uh, that we can uh, consider. So the first phase is callbacks. Uh, raise your hand if you used, if you have used callbacks. Come on, there's a few of you in the back. You've, we've all used callbacks. This is known. All right, so everybody uses callbacks. Raise your hand if you've uh, used promises. Phase two, cool, awesome. A little less, but definitely people are using it. Raise your hand if you use generators. Ooh, <laughs> a sad trombone. Everybody, raise your hand if you confidently understand them. Yeah. So yeah, really not many. And then async and await is phase four. Raise your hand if you use that. Cool. Raise your hand if you use the what? The the rest. Um. Yeah, I don't know. You use anybody using observables? Not even you. Come on. Ah, <laughs> uh, cool. But uh, another question about async and await. Who uses it in production? Cool. Cool. Those are the fun companies to work for. I'm sure. I'm sure they're all hiring. Cool. All right. So actually, uh, actually, I fooled you. We're actually going to look at phase zero first. And so this is uh, synchronous code. This is, of course, not asynchronous. And you're probably wondering why I'm talking about it, um, but hopefully you will soon understand why. So of course, uh, synchronous code exists in a single stack in a single stack uh, in JavaScript. Um, the code that we have here represents, uh, in my humble opinion, the uh, simplest and perhaps most elegant way to execute functions, uh, get the return values, you know, pass data in, uh, get data out, and then uh, you know, execute a, an application. Certainly there's people that don't agree with that, but you know, I, I think this, this code is pretty uh, terse. Uh, and so this will actually be the shortest code example we will look at in this presentation. So each one of the, the different uh, phases I'm going to show you is basically going to follow the same pattern. <coughs> Cool. All right, let's uh, step through this code. It's uh, pretty simple. So what we want to do is we want to execute this function called send message. And so send message accepts two arguments. The first is the user ID that we want to send a message to. And the second is the message that we want to send uh, to that user. And so once we send the message, we want to find the result of the operation. Did the message uh, send, was it successful or not? Uh, um, louder? A little, little, little closer to the mic. Oh, perfect. There we go. Cool. Did you just turn it on? Did I? Oh. I don't know. Maybe. It's got this really. Oh, it's red. Is red mean on? <laughs> oh, wow. Sorry about that. Cool. All right. So uh, within this function, uh, once we get the user ID and the message, uh, we're going to uh, pass the user ID into this get user uh, function. We're going to re receive uh, information about the user out of it. So this represents you know, a more complete user object. Uh, we then pass the user object into the can send method. Um, it'll determine whether or not we can send a message to that user, and it'll send a message back, or it'll send back the variable able. So able is simply a true false value. Uh, if we're not able to send a message, we're going to return from the function. We're going to return a false. You know, no message was sent. Otherwise, we're going to call the send message, or the, sorry, the uh, write message function. So that's going to actually write the message, um, passing in the user, the complete user object, and the original message variable. And then we're going to return the result of that operation. And so the, the uh, write message function is going to tell us uh, if the message was sent successfully or not. So this code, this all ex executes in a single stack. So what that means is that if any one of these functions were to you know, stop your application from running, that would mean the entire application would stop running. Um, and so in a browser, you know that's pretty bad. You're getting some jittery scroll. But in Node, you know, that's killer. It means your entire server is no longer not able to serve other requests. <coughs> Cool. And then error handling, of course, with this pattern, we have the, the uh, try catches. And so what you do is you, you wrap your call to send message in a try, and then you catch an error uh, if they occur. Uh, so in this case, we're going to you know, try to call the send message function. Um, however, inside a send message, we're going to throw an error uh, instead of actually doing any work. And so that'll get caught in our catch. And then we're going to print the error message to uh, standard error. Um, otherwise, if it were to succeed, it would have called the uh, console log below. Cool. All right. Now that that's out of the way, let's look at callbacks. So here you have callbacks. 
Fortunately, with my font, uh, normally it works, but you know it's Linux. The kernel updated, and now the uh, emojis are black and white. So if you look closely, you can see that oh, this, this laser isn't working. Uh, if you look here, you can see these little clock icons. And so normally that would be uh, you know like a syntax error in JavaScript. Oop! Wow, I just went all the way to the end. I'm sorry. Did you say something back there? Yeah, um, All right. So within the code, every time you see one of these little clock icons, what it means is. Uh, this is a point in the application where um, we're, we're done doing work in the current stack and we're able to process uh, other work within our application. Or it'll represent places within the code where we'll come back uh, into the execution. So it's like a symbol that shows you how you come in and out of uh, the code that is executing. All right, so cool with this callback pattern. Of course, this looked pretty familiar to us node engineers. Uh, in this case, um, the syntax has changed a little bit. Uh, this time, when we call our send message function, uh, we're still passing in the, user, the username and the message. However, we have this third argument now, and that is our callback. <coughs> callback. Uh, and so the callback, uh, of course, this, this pattern, I think it's called the error back. So the first argument is an error. The second argument is what would normally be the return value. It is the, the result of the operation. And then so we, we actually pass this function around. Uh, it is kept for a while. And then once it's finally uh, needed, the, the function is executed. Um, I'm blanking. What's the name of this pattern? This name for the Continu continuation pattern. Um, cool. Um, all right, so within our send message function, again, we see uh, the callback is the third argument. And so what we're doing within our send message function is uh, we're going to execute this call to get user. We're going to pass in user ID and this callback. And then so the get user function, perhaps it's you know, talking to a database. It's going to send some message over the network. Once that's done, uh, this function is just going to gonna stop. It's going to um, not continue doing work. Um, other functions within the application are going to be able to call. For example, the request handlers coming into Express, they're going to be able to fire and do their own thing. However, once the database operation is complete, it's then going to call our callback, and our code will continue. Uh, and so that's you know, the, the clock is where we continue. So in this case, we take the user object, we then pass it into send, can send along with another callback. Once that's done, we get the able variable. If we're not able to send the message, we're going to execute the callback where the first argument is an error. In this case, there's, no, there's technically no error. It's just that we're not able to send a message. And then the second argument is the, uh, the result of the operation, which is the false. And then we're going to return. Um, otherwise, we're going to continue on. We're going to call our send message function, passing the user message uh, like before, as well as the callback as the third argument. Um, and so this is the pattern we all sort of know and love in uh, Node. Um, however, one thing to keep in mind with this pattern is that we're, anytime we call a function and we pass in a, um, a callback, we're sort of, we're just throwing away the return value. So if you think of a um, function in JavaScript as having sort of uh, two important details, one being arguments being fed into it, and the second being the return value, um, you know, I guess sort of the syntax that the language gives us, uh, we're now only using, I suppose, half the features, right? So it kind of, maybe it feels a little dirty. It's like, you know, we're not using everything we could be using here. Um, and so the, the syntax for this ends up being a bit heavier. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot more, you know, characters going on here than there was in our previous example. <clears throat> uh, and then with error handling, uh, we don't throw errors. You never want to throw an error. Uh, in one of these uh, functions, which expects a callback. Um, you know, you're going to confuse the calling environment. You know, engineers aren't expecting to call a function. And then they have to wrap it in a try catch. So you never want to uh, throw an error within a callback, within this callback pattern. So what you want to do with these errors is uh, when you do encounter an error, you want to call that callback that was passed in, uh, where the first argument is an error value. So in this case, you can see that we're calling send message, we're passing in our variables, we're passing in our callback. And now, unlike before, where we just drop the errors on the floor, this time we're actually going to check them and then do something with them uh, once they occur. And then within our send message, uh, you can see that um, we want to simulate an error. And so we're executing uh, this function where we pass in uh, the error object to callback. <clears throat> uh, one thing I'm doing here, though, is I'm actually wrapping that call um, I'm not immediately executing callback in the current stack. Instead, I'm wrapping it in a set immediate. Uh, if you were to um, call that callback immediately, um, the, the calling environment is going to see things uh, occur out of order. Um, so for example, if after the send message line, um, 
let's see, so if we look at like right here, if, the, if, uh, if you had a line here that said like, you know, print a message to the screen, um, if you were to execute this callback immediately within this function, um, you would see the, the result of this operation occur, like you would see this console error would occur before uh, the log message down here occurs. Uh, so you want to add this set timeout to ensure that the callbacks are executed in a different stack. Uh, this is lovingly referred to as introducing Zalgo into your API uh, by the Node community. Cool. Has anybody ever been bitten by Zalgo? Has this issue ever happened? Okay, a few people. Yep. You've caused it, right? Cool. All right. Um, and so with error propagation, you know, as we get these errors, every time we have an error, we want, we want to be able to handle it. So in this case, um, for example, within our get user, if an error happened, we, we fail the callback within the get or the can send method. method uh, if there's an error, we call the callback. So this is a pretty, pretty common pattern. This is about the simplest way you can handle errors. Of course, you could have more complex errors. Um, depending on your failure cases, maybe a failure isn't too bad at, at, at some point. Um, but yeah, this is the simplest way to do error handling. All right. Um, so yeah, phase two, we have something called promises. And so each one of these phases uh, essentially happens at a future point in time uh, than one uh, before it. It's not that necessarily any phase is uh, better or worse than any phase before it, and every single phase has their, has their pros and cons. Um, however, they're just introduced uh, later in time. So for example, promises, these were introduced in ES 2015. Um, and so promises, they represent um, they do not represent a new syntax in the language. They instead represent a, um, a cool state machine for executing uh, callbacks, essentially. Uh, and so you don't actually need um, the language itself. You don't need JavaScript to support uh, these promises. You could actually use a polyfill, for example, Bluebird. Who's used Bluebird? Cool. Bunch of us. Sweet. All right. And so promises, the code looks like this. Um, again, so. In this case, we are using return values. So the thing with promises is, is that a uh, promise function actually returns an object, and this object that it returns is a promise. Uh, and so we do use the return values. Um, however, you know, we still use these callbacks. Um, I suppose we don't necessarily call, call them callbacks. In this case, um, this, uh, this function that we're passing in where we, we handle the result, you know, it's not maybe technically a callback because it doesn't use the, you know, the error first notation, but certainly it's a function which will execute in the future. And so the syntax for this doesn't look necessarily too different um, from the callback pattern that we've used before. Uh, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to execute the send message function. We're going to pass in the user ID and the message. Immediately within the send message function, we're going to return a call to send user. And so that send user uh, function is itself a uh, function which returns a promise, as I had mentioned. Uh, so again, maybe that send user message or uh, function is you know, communicating with the database uh, to get the data that we need. Um, however, it's not until once we call the, um, the, the get user method, um, we do some method chaining on it. So that's why we're able to do the dot then. And then so we, we tell this promise that, hey, you know, once you're done, call this function here. And then so we're able to serve requests and do whatever within our application. And then shortly in the future, Hopefully, you know, a few milliseconds later, uh, our execute our uh, function executes, and we're able to continue. And so, you know, we get the we get the user object that way. We pass it into can send. Can send is another function which returns a promise. So, can send goes to the database of the user. Um, uh, once that operation is complete, we call the dot then that follows it, and then we pass in this function. Um, and so. In the future, once that code has been executed, our function is then called. Uh, we get this able value. And then from within this promise here, uh, we return a false value. So of course, false isn't a promise. It's just a, a simple uh, Boolean variable. And so what that means is the, the entire promise here will end up resolving into that promise. Or I'm sorry. The entire promise here will end up resolving into the false value. Um, and so what it means is when the promise resolves is that um, you know, whatever that dot then up there uh, that function is actually going to finally fire, and then the result variable is going to be that false variable, um, that false value that we return from our promise. Um, however, if we are able to send the message, we're going to return a, another call to the right message where we pass in the user message. 
And as you can probably guess, that itself is a promise which will resolve into uh, the true false value of whether or not the message was uh, successfully sent. Uh, and so where with the um, phase zero, the synchronous code, sort of the, the pattern we get is that you have this flat line um, you know, on the left side of the code. You see your code's going, it's pretty straight. Um, when you have uh, nested callbacks, you're getting into the flying V of death. The pyramid of doom, that's what it is. You get into the pyramid of doom uh, situation. And so that's why everybody loves, pro uh, loves promises, that it fixes the pyramid of doom. But then you get um, what I like to call the zigzag of, maybe not so much doom, but certainly you get the zigzag pattern. Uh, so you know, as you get a lot of promises going on, you're just doing a lot of these zigzags. I'm not a, not a big fan of myself, but you know, a lot of people do like it. Um, <clears throat> so each time within one of these promises you call a dot then um, and you return another promise, we can refer to that as um, building a promise chain. And so you know, over time you can have you know, several different promises within your promise chain. Um, or actually at a previous employer we had an infinite loop in a promise chain. Uh, that was pretty, pretty fun. We'd have a memory leak that would take uh, months, but you'd slowly increase maybe hundreds of megabytes over that time span. <laughs> very, very subtle. It was like a long polling code. Uh, really neat, neat problem. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, however, we, of course, have to look at the bad situations. And so with promises, you know, we don't call them throwing. We don't call them exceptions. We call them uh, rejections. And so, wow. So in this case, um, what we do is within a promise, we can return a rejected promise. So in this case, our send message function is going to return, return promise.reject. Um, and then what we do is we pass the reason for the rejection in there. In this case, we're going to pass this error object. Um, however, so once our send message calls um, is called, uh, we also do this dot then to chain uh, the result of that operation. However, in this case, our then is not going to call. Uh, instead, the catch operation is going to call. And then so our catch is going to have the result uh, of that error. Cool. All right, phase three, generators and yield. Um, this is a new syntax. This is uh, introduced in ES 2015. Uh, you can transpile to it, for example, you know, Babel. Anybody uh, transpiling with Babel right now? Oh, a few people. Is Webpack, is that the new thing? Are people doing this stuff with Webpack now? Okay, so is anybody doing this with Webpack then? Okay, all right. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm kind of behind the times, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so you can, you can transpile, it cannot be polyfilled. Uh, so it was first introduced in uh, IOJS version 1.0. Cool, all right, so this is the syntax. This is, the, this is really the ugliest generator you can get. Uh, and so, you know, I, I kind of made it look ugly on purpose just to sort of step through it and um, show you how it works. And so don't, don't be too afraid. I'm going to show you an easier example uh, in a moment. All right. So the send message function below is our generator. Um, that asterisk is the syntax we use to denote that it is a generator. So the cool thing about these generator functions is they're able to halt um, halfway through. Um, and then you're able to do stuff you know, elsewhere within the application and then return uh, to the generator from whence you uh, exited. So in this case, the first thing we do is uh, we execute send message where we pass in our arguments. And then the result of that function being executed is our generator. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take generator. We're going to call next. Um, let's see. I get a little bit confused. I'm not sure if uh, we've executed the first line of code yet or not. Um, but at any point, at any rate, um, we're going to go into our send message function. Uh, we're going to take the arguments that were passed into it. Um, we're going to take user ID. We're going to pass it to get user. And then we're going to yield the result of that operation. So normally generators, I suppose they were built with the intent of you know, perhaps um, forever generating a list of numbers. So like uh, the hello world of generators is uh, to yield an ever incrementing number, for example. You, know, you call your generator, you get a one. You call it again, you get a two. So with a new generator, you could have like a for loop. However, in this case, we're sort of hijacking uh, these generators and we're using them for control flow. So in this case, our get user function is actually returning a promise again, and then we're going to yield the result of that promise. So what we do is we yield the result of that promise, and you see the little clock, which means uh, we're able to uh, you know, do other work in the application. Um, 
this yielded value is um, the promise value itself is what's returned from the generator. So when we call generator.next, that's going to be, um, it's going to return us the value and I think some metadata about the generator uh, from it. So we're able to call this dot value, and so dot value is the value which was yielded from the generator. In this case, our get user promise. We then call dot then on that promise where we pass in this function execute in the future. So once our database call is complete or whatever, our function will end up calling. So from there, we take the user object. Uh, we then call the generator again. We call generator dot next, and we pass the value back in. So the user value which is passed back in is now uh, the uh, returned from that yield, and it is now assigned to the user uh, variable. So we then go to the next line, we take the user, we pass it in the can send, uh, you know, it's going to do its database thing, it's a promise, we're going to yield that variable, uh, we're going to take uh, that yielded promise, we're going to call then, we're going to pass in this object, uh, and you sort of get the picture. And so what we're doing is we're, we're yielding these promises from our generator, we're waiting for them to resolve. Uh, once the promise is complete, we take the data and we pass it back into the generator. So it feels kind of weird. You know, you're taking data out, putting data in, taking data out, putting data in. What if, for example, instead of putting the, the user back into the generator, um, once my promise was yielded, what if I instead put the number seven back in? You know, it, it seems kind of weird, but you, certainly you could do it. And so that yield get user would return a seven. Uh, you know, it, it just feels kind of weird. Uh, and so this syntax here is very powerful, uh, very verbose. Um, just, just a total nightmare. So, for example, can you imagine, like within your set, uh, not that this is bad uh, about generators in uh, general, just my particular implementation. So, for example, you could imagine adding one or two or three more yield statements within your send message. And then, so in this case, we would actually need one or two or three more uh, nested levels uh, in our calling environment. So this just requires very intimate knowledge about the uh, insides of our function uh, from within the situation in which we call it. So this right here is, again, just the, the most horrible way to represent this. Um, luckily for us, there's a nice way to represent this. Uh, since, since the pattern we're doing is pretty simple, take a variable out, wait for it to, uh, wait for the promise to um, give us the value, and then put it back in. Uh, of course, that could be automated, and so we can use a library, for example, Co is a library that can do this for us. Co, I believe, stands for coroutine. Uh, and so what you can do is uh, with you, um, you wrap a generator function in this co call, that co call ends up returning a promise, and then everything within that generator, uh, co is basically going to keep getting these these uh, these promises, um, sticking it back into the generator. If it ever gets a promise that is um, uh, rejected, it's then going to return a promise that rejects. Uh, and so it's it's a pretty nice tool to make this um, working with generators and promises much easier. Uh, so in this case, you can see at the top of the screen our send message call where we pass in the, the user ID and the message and then call our then with our uh, function to execute in the future. That's a, a, the exact same code that we had uh, with the promises. Uh, so the only thing that has changed in this case is that our uh, generator function is now wrapped in this code routine. So in this case, Co has introduced a new uh, function scope, um, but otherwise isn't too, too dissimilar uh, from the um, from the, the phase zero, the uh, synchronous code that we looked at before. So, so we're getting closer to our sort of ideal uh, syntax. Oh yeah, then I mentioned rejection. Let's actually look at the rejection. So if within our co uh, call, where we're calling this, uh, wrapping this generator, if we yield a promise which is rejected, um, then we will catch that um, within our original promise call. So our send message, our then, is not called, but our catch is Cool. All right. Now, this is the part you've all been waiting for, I hope, unless you're excited about generators. Um, so this is uh, async functions, which use the async keyword and the await keyword. Again, this is a new syntax. Uh, you can't transpile it. You can polyfill it. It was introduced in ES2017. Uh, pretty, pretty new stuff. So this is the syntax for that. Um, one thing you, you're probably immediately noticing is that that's a little bit ugly, immediately invoked function execution iffy, iffy? I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway, it's when you wrap a function in the parentheses and you've, you follow with the parentheses, parentheses, and that's a way to immediately execute uh, that function. Used to be an old hack you could do to uh, you know, get, get scopage you know, back when we didn't have constant let. However, in this case, we're able to use it with an async function um, and wrap our code in this async, um, yeah, 
if you want to be able to do an await, it needs to be with an async function. And so that's the reason we need this, this function wrapping it. So for example, if you wanted to take this code and paste it into your REPL at home, you know, either the, the node REPL or even, even like a Chrome REPL, um, if you were to use an await at the top level, you would get a syntax error. And so you would need to wrap it in this, this uh, async call. So that's a little bit of an ugly part, but as far as an actual application goes, it's not a big deal because perhaps um, if you wanted to have like an express uh, request handler, for example, be an async function, um, you're already pl giving it a function to call um, when a request uh, executes, and so that function is the function that you would then uh, give the async keyword to. Um, so, so this, this async iffy only really matters uh, with REPL type code. All right, so now that that's out of the way, I'll let's actually look at the code. So we have this send message function, same arguments as we're used to. However, this time it's preceded with the async keyword. Um, within our function, uh, we have these await keywords, um, which are you know, pretty similar looking to the yields that we looked at with generators. Um, when we call the code, uh, so within our async function, um, we want to get the result. And so you know, we say let result equals, and then we await the execution of that function. And so what that means is you know, we're going to call, send message, we're going to pass in the arguments. Um, we're going to receive those arguments. We're then going to call this get user uh, method, which is also an async function, and then we're going to await the results. And so at this point in time, the, uh, our code is basically done. We're able to serve you know, requests elsewhere in the application. Uh, once that's complete, we're then able to continue uh, where we left off. So we get the value from get user. Of course, we assign it to our user variable. We then pass user into can send, uh, and then we're able to wait again. Uh, and then so, so we, we go through this operation. Um, if we ever return a um, non-async function from within async function, that is what the async function is going to uh, return. So in this case, when we return our false, false will be the result uh, that is assigned to uh, the result variable. And then, of course, we call the final write message function, and then the result of that function is what this uh, send message will uh, return. And of course, we have to handle errors, and so we're sort of back to the, the try-catch of yesterday. Uh, raise your hand if you hate try-catch. Okay, a few of us. I kind of like them. Uh, I think they're okay. I do hear a lot of people do dislike uh, try-catches, however. So in this case, what we do is we wrap our call to send message in a try-catch. Um, within our try-catch, we're able to use the throw error, throw new error uh, syntax um, that we can do with synchronous code, and then that error will actually get caught by our try catch in our async code. Of course, you can't throw an error within a callback and expect the, the error back, to, um, the callback to be called with error. Um, however, with this async await code, we are able to do that. Cool thing about async and await is they're, they're just promises. Uh, you know, they, they do some cool stuff under the hood, but at the end of the day, they're, they're basically just promises. And so earlier when I showed you that code, and I was like, you know, we're awaiting that get user call, and that get user is an async, and await can send, and that's an async function. Well, though, those get user and can send, those can actually just be promises. And so uh, uh, async functions and promises are 100% uh, interoperable. So in this case here, we have the send message call. This is the exact same promise code that we showed earlier on. And so um, we call it, we pass in the arguments, we do our then, we get the result. And then our send message is now a uh, async function. And so this means you can refactor uh, your application pretty easily from the bottom up. And so, if, for example, send message, that could be your controller, that could be your express handler. Uh, the send message, that could be your model that's actually interacting with the database. And so maybe you want to change all the models in your database first and make them async functions. You want to leave your controllers the same because you don't want to do all this work at the exact same time. And so you can definitely do it from the bottom up. Um, errors, of course, are also completely interoperable. So in this case, we throw an error from our async function. That is going to trigger the catch uh, with our promise code. And as you might have been able to expect, you can also refactor from the top down. So perhaps you want to change your express code first and make that async, and then you want to change your database later. Um, so in that case, we're now you know, awaiting a call to send message, and our send message is just a good old promise. This is pretty sweet because, for example, say that you build a library and you want this library, you want to release it out in the wild. And so you can create this library um, using async functions 
And then within the calling environment, you know, they, perhaps they just want to use your library as a normal uh, promise. Uh, they can totally do that, assuming the version node they have is compatible with uh, the async keywords. Um, so totally, totally interoperable. Uh, and then, of course, when you refactor from the top down, if you return a rejected promise um, from within your model code, you're able to wrap it in a try catch, and it will uh, execute the way you'd expect. Uh, the Node API, of course, uses um, callbacks, and so there's these lovely tools to promiseify them. Uh, one of them is built in uh, to the latest version of Node, so you can use util.promiseify, where you pass in a function, and then it's going to take that function, it's going to count the number of arguments. So for example, read file has three arguments, where the first one is the file path, the second one is some options like encoding information, the third one is the callback. And so it's able to look at that, and it's able to create a promise for you, uh, which will invoke that function and um, you know, do the right thing under the hood. Where it's going to you know, call the callback, and, and the callback of read file is going to trigger the promise, uh, et cetera. Uh, so there's this cool library written by my, my buddy Brian, a uh, friend of ours. Uh, and so it's called PyFall Promiseify All. And so this is a useful library. It's much like Bluebird has a method called Promiseify All. And so this is a tool which uses util.promiseify. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to wrap every single method of a object with um, async methods. So in this case, let's see how the code looks. And so within our async function, what we're able to do is we're able to await a call to read file, where we pass in the first argument is the, the file that we want to open. Uh, and the second argument here, we're able to call um, you know, fs.readfile async. And so fs, now that we've passed it in async, has all these uh, sibling methods. And so normally there'd be a read file, but now there's read file async. Uh, and so that's useful for, for example, um, uh, you read this code, I noticed that you're using promises with that. And so, you know, are you using bluebird.promiseify all with that? Yeah, we did that to promise all the Redis commands. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, so yeah, it's really useful to be able to uh, use async and await with, you know, for example, Redis. So I use this for my side projects. It, uh, it works pretty cool. And then we're able to, yeah, with minimal boilerplate, we didn't have to set these promises up ourselves. Uh, we're able to await these native um, calls to the API. Uh, can anybody spot the anti-pattern that I've introduced here? Yep. You're, you're creating blocking code because you're awaiting the read file for stuff.txt before you can even initialize the read file on data.txt, which you could trigger both promises and then do a promise.all and all of them. That's true, yep. So what he's saying is we're, we're reading stuff. We're waiting for it to be done. Once it's done, we're reading data. We're waiting for it to be done. And then once that's done, we're, we're outputting the result. And of course, we could have done them in parallel. Uh, and so um, it is kind of easy to do this kind of stuff. I think um, I, I kind of had the feeling that uh, you know, with, with the callback patterns, with the promises, we kinda, it was maybe more obvious when to do stuff in parallel. Um, the syntax make, does make it a little easy to uh, start writing more procedural code, so it's one thing to keep an eye on. Of course, that can be fixed, you know, pretty easily. Instead, you could do you could perform an await on promise at all, as was mentioned. Um, we provide an array of promises. Once the array of promises is complete, um, or once the first call throws, uh, sorry, rejects, um, you know, once that happens, whatever happens first, um, we're then able to get the data. So we're able to do this work in parallel uh, using promise at all. Cool, that's the talk. <laughs>